the yes. topics and the issues that make people feel uncomfortable. <laughs> I'd like to <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even start. <laughs> So one of these topics that uh, we get asked a lot of questions on is uh, this topic of, uh, of how long people wait between uh, eating meat and uh, consuming milk or uh, dairy products. None of us is really much of a question because we don't eat too many dairy products, but uh, for those of us who, uh, who are concerned, uh, there are, you will hear of differing traditions, uh, people uh, we'll tell you that different uh, communities or their parents or their grandparents used to wait a certain number of hours between uh, you know, eating uh, meat or chicken and uh, drinking milk or eating uh, cheese. So the more uh, the customs that you that you will hear of that, that do have some kind of uh, root or a basis somewhere, discussion uh, the Gemara said the Gemara mentions that uh, we we should not eat dairy products after having eaten meat, after having consumed meat, for the length of kidei sivodah, for, for the length of uh, a meal, duration of a meal. Interestingly enough, the Gemara has very little by way of discussion on this topic, just don't eat meat, for, don't eat uh, milk or dairy products for duration of the meal. And so there is a, uh, there's a machloket, there is a, uh, a pretty significant dispute amongst the Roshanim as to why we don't uh, drink, we don't consume dairy products after meat, and, and how long is this kebe soda? How long is this you know, length or duration uh, of, a, of a meal? So, on the topic of the duration of a meal, there are those who held by the length of time that you're typically satiated after a meal, and since people typically eat breakfast, maybe they'll snack on something in the afternoon and they'll have dinner, so we approximate uh, six hours. So if you're waking up and praying with the sunrise, God's up and having breakfast at, uh, at uh, quarter to six in the summer and uh, a little bit later in the, uh, in the winter. And then six hours later towards the middle of the day, say around uh, one o'clock, you're probably hungry having lunch and then you get home. Give or take seven o'clock, you've, you've rounded out you know, three meals over the course of uh, 12 hours, one at the beginning, one in the middle, one at the end. And, uh, and the rationale is that it takes about that long to uh, significantly digest anything that you've uh, eaten, at least meat anyway, it takes a little longer than, uh, than other foods. So, as long as you have meat in your stomach, uh, you'll, you'll every so often be reminded of it, and, uh, and people shouldn't come to believe that you can mix the tastes of the two, that it's okay if you have meat and then you go ahead and, uh, and have some cheese, Flavors are going to meld, and uh, this is precisely what we're looking to uh, to avoid. Another perfectly legitimate opinion holds. Interestingly enough, there's a, uh, an allusion to this in the Torah itself, where during Parashat uh, Aslau, the uh, the quail, little brown birds, very cute, with white spots on them, and they're very tasty with uh, curry, turmeric, found in the pan. So. When, uh, when the Jews complained in the desert about not having the wilderness, about not having uh, meat to eat, so Hashem gives them these tiny little birds, and they ate them by the tongue. And then they were punished, and a lot of them died. So we're told that this punishment, this plague began, Habasar Olenu Ben Shinehim. The meat was still between their teeth, and the punishment uh, had, already, uh, had already begun. So what exactly of what relevance is the meat being between their teeth? Easy, holds one opinion. The meat being between their teeth is the reason why we aren't able to consume uh, dairy products afterwards because there may be, it's not a question of how long it takes you to digest. Maybe some people digest faster than others. So even if you're in the Guinness Book of World Records for really fast digestion of meat products, you still shouldn't be drinking uh, milk or eating cheese after having had meat. Why? Because you may have meat between your teeth. And if that's the case, I don't want to sound like a reformer, what happens if I happen to uh, bust out the floss? If the concern is the meat that's between my teeth, I'll go after it. I'll get my unwaxed, mint-flavored floss, whatever, and I'll go after it, and maybe use some mouthwash, some peroxide, and my mouth is squeaky clean. And it should be perfectly permissible for me to go ahead and uh, you know, slice some, uh, some hard cheese and enjoy it after a meal that began with meat. 
in fact, Roshat Wairah has interesting uh, an interesting um, scene on this topic where Abraham Avinu, according to Rambam, this was all a prophetic vision. It was all a, I say, a dream, but a vision. And he sees these three men coming his way. Beautiful midrash on this topic, apropos of what we were just talking about. The midrash says that uh, Abraham Avinu, when he encountered these uh, uh, these angels, he believed they were men, which is why he thought to prepare them something to eat. So, way to a man's heart is to his stomach. So he decided to prepare them something to eat. So he runs to the uh, to the bakar, runs to the beef because beef is good eating, and he has one of his lads. We're told this to Shmuel, slaughter and prepare. Uh, one of these cows, according to the Midrash, might have been killed. And he tells Sarah that she should go prepare bread. And he grabbed some butter and prepared a meal. So the guy asked this question, knew, so what came first? Maybe Ram Abinu, he lived before the Torah, and so it didn't really matter what order they were eating milk and meat. At the end of the day, it's just a precaution. It's not the, the Torah hasn't forbidden me from eating cheese after I had a hamburger. Forbidden me from eating a cheeseburger can have the two of them cooked together. It's not to say that I, that biblically speaking, I did something wrong if I had cheese for dessert after I had uh, goulash. So, one opinion says, well, he was before uh, the Torah was given, it really doesn't matter. The other opinion says, no, although it doesn't sound that way from the preparation of the ingredients, explains that when he, he serves them the, uh, the meal, he first gives them, he takes hama wa halam, he gives them milk and then uh, butter and milk. And then he presents them with this uh, a cow or a calf that he had prepared. Rachel talked about his young calf. So if that's the order, then hooray. You know, there's no uh, butter or milk in anybody's teeth. The angels didn't eat anything, by the way, which is why the Midrash says, Right? Behold, the three people are standing, three men are standing uh, over him, and he came into his tent looking for a place to take a break from the, uh, the midday heat. And then, uh, right? So in the beginning, he, they're introduced to us as people, and then they leave as angels. It says in the Midrash, how do you know that they weren't people? Easy. He prepared a massive meal. They didn't eat. Angels don't eat. Silly. That's, uh, didn't know then, you know now. So he thought they were people. That's how they appeared to him in this uh, vision. Apparently, he was pretty convinced. I wouldn't slaughter a cow for just anybody. I, unless I knew these were dignified, honorable people. I just didn't save the cow for myself. So he went through all these, uh, these motions and realized they don't need. Uh, there's support for this from the story of Manoah, if you're familiar with it, the father of Shimshon, Samson. So his father, when he encounters this angel that comes to tell his wife, interestingly enough, the angel doesn't do much talking to him, the angel tells his wife that uh, she's going to uh, to conceive a child, and that uh, he's going to be born, he should be a nazir, he should not cut his hair, uh, come into contact with impurity, etc. And he says, wait, 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 don't go, I'm going to prepare a goat as a sacrifice to you. And the angel responds very emphatically, um, don't try to retain me because I won't eat from your food. And if you're going to bring a goat, why don't you bring it to Hashem? I'm just a messenger. I came to tell you what I told you, and this is totally out of whack. Nobody sacrifices to angels. Not my, not my thing. Even if you go ahead and do it, I'm not going to benefit from it. So angels don't eat. Okay, but people do. Is there a concern for the uh, meat being between your teeth, and therefore it's relatively easy to... Uh, to abate, to counter, if only we, uh, we would floss our teeth after we eat? Or is it more a function of the joys and challenges of digestion that sometimes uh, the taste of what it was that you just ate, uh, pleasant or unpleasant, may continue to, uh, to resurface and therefore you'd uh, make the potential mistake of you know, believing that it's okay to have the two, the two together. So here it's the Shulchan It was not invented, but uh, it became a very popular opinion to, uh, to be sensitive to both uh, angles, to both aspects of this. In other words, yes, we're concerned for the meat between your teeth, which means if, for example, let's say your family's from North Africa, for whatever bizarre coincidental reason they have no teeth, and, and nothing to do with the quality of dental care in North Africa, and we'll move on. So they have dentures, they can afford them, and they decide to change, they have a pair of meat dentures and a pair of dairy dentures, 
Um, the gal's laughing because nobody in North Africa eats cheese. You're right. Uh, it's a very <laughs> hypothetical situation. No dairy dishes in my house. It is what it is. But, in theory, someone were to sit there and have a meat meal with meat dentures, and then either floss them really well, or just take them out and put in the, uh, the dairy ones, I uh, say, so wait a second, I, I want my money back. I thought that if I invest in a second pair of dentures, I get to eat dairy products however I want. So, our answer would be no. Another example of this would be someone who chews meat for a child in the days before the, uh, the Cuisinart. The, uh, the biodegradable version of the Cuisinart was uh, a father and mother chewing meat for their kids and then letting their kids, you know, younger children, I guess, without teeth. They lost their teeth by the time they were 10, but for the few years that you had them in your, uh, the highlights of your life, you would be able to chew meat for your kids and then give them soft, you know, pre-moistened, chewed meat, effectively ground meat, I guess, today and uh, and your kids would be able to uh, to enjoy this so what if I chewed the meat and didn't swallow it I'm guilty if the question is you know is there any meat between my teeth but I'm innocent when it comes to digestion I didn't swallow anything you know, nothing uh, significant so once again our custom is to be uh, a little bit uh, strict and to adopt the strictures of both uh, both sides of the uh, of the discussion both sides of the argument and we will therefore wait at least as long as a meal before uh, indulging in, uh, in dairy products. So how long is a meal? Well, opinion number one says, and this is the overwhelming majority of them, that uh, we wait as long as a meal satiates you to be six hours. There is an opinion, it's mentioned in the Tosafot, and this was the custom in uh, parts of, uh, well, in Germany for now, but parts of, uh, of Holland, where people would wait the amount of time it takes to finish a meal. Out of time, the duration of your typical meal. Obviously, they weren't just about meals on the Upper West Side. People here have meals for five or six hours. But back in the day, they didn't have air conditioning. They started eating early. When it got hot, people left. So you would sit down, you would eat. It would take approximately something like 45 minutes to an hour to finish a meal. I mean, that's pretty generous. On weekdays, I don't think anybody eats that long unless you're going out to a restaurant. But uh, that was the, the approximation. That was the, uh, the working assumption. So. The Gemara just says, however, the length of the duration of the meal, is it the duration of my uh, state of, uh, of satiety? Am I just satisfied and therefore no longer hungry? Which must indicate that I still have meat in my digestive tract somewhere. Or is it a function of how long it takes to eat a meal? Where there the concern would be, hey, guess what? You can sit there and you can have a hamburger. Don't uh, bust out the, the you know, creme brulee until after... 45 minutes have gone by, so no one should think, well, I had my hamburger 45 minutes ago, so I'm right now uh, really excited about this dairy dessert, and so in the same meal, I can have meat and milk, and everyone would say, wait a second, if you're going to have meat and milk in the same meal, who's going to distinguish between what was the first course or the second course? Uh, you come to eat them together, you end up eating cheeseburgers. Wait, is it an opinion that wait three hours or so? Right, that's that middle, the middle ground. Uh, this is the much more difficult to explain opinion because this one doesn't have roots in the Talmud or the, uh, the Tosafot. So, it exists. It exists. Uh, it, was, uh, it was pretty harshly attacked by you know, the six-hour camp, where what the Gemara said can be understood one way or the other. People who have meals every three hours are probably morbidly obese. I mean, it's not a you usually have two or three meals a day, and you pretty much retire from eating, at least for that 24-hour period. There's always tomorrow. <laughs> Uh, but people who, who understood, those who understood that it was a function of how long you go between meals, three hours was a little bit short. For those who understood that it's a question of how long a meal takes, they're laughing too because, hey, wait a second, you know, it takes you three hours to eat a meal and you have two or three of them a day, you probably don't work all that much. And that may be true. So my, my yachy friends who holds the three hours usually say that's uh, like that's a stringency on the one hour, rather than holding the one hour, it couldn't look Right, so it's, it's not a diet version of the six hour, it's not a sugar-free, right. how long does it take you to go from one meal to the next? It's more, uh, it's more a little bit more strict than the 45 minute meal. Right, but are you which, which I hear, just, it, it doesn't have uh, exceptionally deep roots. Having the German community is very proud of their customs, and they, they tend to be very uh, adamant about not accepting newly introduced ones, so it likely dates back quite a while. 
um, but apparently not as long as those original two uh, two opinions. So. I learned that when um, when I was in Manchester when I started keeping or kosher, mm -hmm. and then kosher the 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 Ashkenazi rabbi that's how mm -hmm. he taught you know it was like three hours. So Manchester is an interesting community. Uh, there was once a Jewish community in uh, in England. It was referred to by the Rishonim, the Tosafot, for example. Tosafot, most of them were in France. So they would refer to England as Eretz Ha'i, the, the island nation, 24 miles from France to, uh, to England. So uh, there was a Jewish community there, and they were all massacred, unfortunately, Shemit Tomit Tamam, referred to uh, the massacre uh, of York. I think it was in the, 12, in the 13th century. Exactly. 13th century. And England was later repopulated by German Jews. Mm. So it was mostly Frankfurt, Frankfurt am Main. Mm. Jews wandered back into England, I think, in the 1500s, uh, 1600s. And therefore, almost everything done in England today is effectively uh, German. So that, that pretty much explains that. It's what the Jews did in England thing, beforehand, you know, I don't know. They're yeah. super from. I mean, no. it's a really, really from community. So it's surprising that they would hold something that doesn't have roots. Anywhere. Um, Rabbi Kamenetsky was there, right? In Manchester? I think when he left, Rav, uh, Rav Yaakov Kamenetsky was born, I think he was born in Poland. And I think he moved there, he might have been there during or before, right after the war, before he came here. But he ended up in Muncie, I think, relatively early on. Maybe in the 70s, late 60s. And, and these, these things of five hours and one minute doesn't exist? You know what I'm talking about? So Ravadi talks about five and a half hours. He does mention this. He says that, uh, and ironically, of all places, in yeshiva, he says we're in the yeshiva, where they're learning on a certain schedule, and the guys are hungry, and they need their protein on the one hand, but uh, you know, they can only afford to serve one, one meat meal per day. Uh, he said that uh, there it's possible to be lenient. I have a better question for you. There were communities, and for example, there were such in, uh, in Morocco, who held six hours by meat and three hours by chicken. Mm -hmm. What's the big deal about chicken? Well, this is a machlokit. This is a uh, dispute between Mishnah itself, where you have Rabbi Huda, Rabbi Yosegi, and Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva holds that any meat, birds included, uh, would require you to wait. I mean, it's forbidden to eat them with milk, and therefore, biblically, midoraita. And therefore, whatever you, you uh, if you're eating red meat or poultry, it doesn't matter. You'd have to wait uh, the same amount of time. He doesn't voice an opinion on the amount of time, but the Gemara talks about this. Um, Rabbi Yudah holds, no, it's only Midr Rabbanan, it's rabbinic, because people won't make the clear distinction between what kind of meat it is that you're eating. In fact, the Gemara says that, uh, that geese taste just like pork. Interesting that in Spain they, they you know, breed a certain kind of goose that they claim is just as good as, if not better, than pork. There's about thousands of them in, uh, in Israel. So it does, uh, especially when it's dried, it dries red, so it looks just like, uh, just like pork, pork looks like light colored. As far as meats go, so people wouldn't distinguish between the birds and the, uh, the mammals, and therefore they're likely to make the same uh, the same mistake. According to Rabbi Yisai not only is it permissible biblically, midorata, even midorabanan, it's permissible. And says the Mishnah, where Rabbi Yisai Gerili used to live, they would do it. They would have chicken melts, and nobody uh, had any issue with it. So we tend to hold like Rabbi Yehuda. We hold we take the middle ground that if poultry is uh, forbidden, interesting question, by the way, about deer as well. If uh, we're told, it says three times, that you're not to cook uh, a, a kid, a baby goat. You say kids in English. A lot of us immigrants don't realize that a kid in English literally means a baby goat. Children would be the English word for you know, young adults. Uh, we refer to, uh, to children as kids in a kind of... Uh, Maybe historically pejorative and now already accepted way. So, uh, uh, so uh, what, what's mentioned in the Torah specifically uh, goats, and we understand from this that any behema, any you know, domestic animals, the same category. We we seem we tend to bunch birds and wild animals together, or at least historically wild animals. So aside from lamb, goat, and beef, pretty much any other meat is in the same category. So giraffe with cheese, for example, might uh, be delicacy somewhere and, and may only be a sword in the Ramadan. And if Rabbi Sagiri were here, he would probably eat it and wouldn't uh, give us that much of a hard time about it. So 
At any rate, at least when it comes to poultry, knowing that this itself is only midrabanan and appreciating the fact that you know the concept of waiting between eating meat and drinking uh, milk or eating cheese uh, is itself only midrabanan, we do have a rule, although the Gemara itself says that it doesn't apply, <laughs> we do have a rule that uh, we generally don't apply rabbinic edicts to other rabbinic edicts. Meaning if one thing is already midrabanan, already forbidden rabbinically, then we wouldn't necessarily include in that category something which is itself only forbidden midrabanan. So I can eat meat with uh, milk or cheese, the Torah says so, I'll respect that. If it's only rabbinic that I shouldn't eat cheese after milk, then I'll refrain from doing so, but only because it's rabbinic, only because you told me so. If birds themselves are rabbinically forbidden but biblically permitted, then why should two decrees apply at once? And so there were communities that held this way, that you know, chicken wasn't really included in the original decree in the first place, and uh, if we came to include them, it's only so we shouldn't, make, uh, shouldn't get confused between the two. And that therefore, if there was room to be lenient, we can hold like the second opinion plus, you know, not the 45 minutes to an hour, but the three would be a little bit more meaningful. Yeah. Okay, so if you, just to go back to like the way the way you think about it, because you said either it's because of uh, digestion, either it's because it's you have it between the teeth or not. So based on that, that's why we keep six hours. Would that mean that if you know for a fact I mean, two questions, but in one. If you know for a fact everything is completely digested and you have nothing between the teeth, and so would you be able to eat meat before six hours? And second question is, if at the end of six hours you still feel like the meat coming out still, are you still allowed to eat milk? Right, so uh, excellent questions. I'll answer the second one first. Um, when it comes to digestion, an interesting uh, halachic note about, uh, I mentioned this once about uh, honey, how um, honey from bees is really digested uh, flower pollen. The bees eat it and then they regurgitate it, and the enzymes uh, make it into what we, uh, they're melt into and, and filter as honey. So because they ate it and they digested it and they regurgitated it, effectively vomited it out, uh, we consider it to have changed form. It's not a part of the bee's body, so bees aren't kosher, and milk from a non-kosher animal, or anything that comes from its body for that matter, would be effectively as non-kosher as the animal itself. Um, but here we refer to it as uh, It's, as far as we're concerned, it's uh, it's a waste product. It's, it's not even a byproduct of their bodies, it's just a waste product. Uh, the same way the Gemara says that you're not allowed to benefit from any animal that's sacrificed in Beit HaMikdash as an Ola. It's a Qurban that's burnt in its entirety. You take off the skin and everything else gets, uh, gets burned. And Russ says the only exception would be the uh, coagulated milk in the calf's stomach or in a, a lamb's or a kid's stomach. Why is this? Because by the time it's already partially digested, it's not really even considered a part of the thing's body. I Meaning if it's a part of the thing's body, then the halakha is we can't benefit from it. It's a sacrifice that's burned totally, completely on the Mizbeach. And I can't take any benefit or pleasure from it. But what's partially digested, or even fully digested in the you know, intestines, or the digestive tract, is no longer considered anything. And therefore it's permissible for <laughs> expression of Gibraz, a Kohen who's uh, got a good grip on his uh, soul, <laughs> can go ahead and, and drink this um, cheese-ish coagulated milk in the calf's stomach, uh, even in one shot. So assuming you had the uh, the guts, you'll forgive the, the packing expression, so you had the guts to actually pull the stomach out of a calf and drink the contents, you'd be within your rights because it's not considered anything anymore, it's not considered food. So if after six hours um, the food in our own digestive tract is somewhat to partially digested, maybe even if there's a little remnant of the taste, we can say no. It only takes six hours before uh, your stomach is clear of content, then uh, there's no need for us to, uh, to stretch it any, uh, any further than, uh, than this. Um, so the, the tooth cleaning concept is brought up by the Shulchan and he says that it, uh, if, if you did you know, clean your teeth and you didn't swallow anything, it probably is permissible 
according to both opinions, to go ahead and uh, and consume some kind of dairy product because you haven't swallowed it, so it's not really in your stomach. You clean out your teeth fine. Just that we're not in the habit of doing these kinds of things. It's, it's not commonly done. If it were necessary, though, in theory, you could you know, pull it off and uh, get away with it. It also mentions that based on this, if someone, for whatever reason, were to chew fat and give it to a child without swallowing it, and then clean his or her teeth, so that there is what to rely upon as well. You can also do this and get away with it. You might want to chew fat and, and not swallow it yourself. It happens to be very tasty. But yeah, that's another interesting application of it. The same, by the way, there is a bit of a backdoor when it comes to items that were cooked with meat. We spoke last week about uh, steam and flavors being absorbed by, uh, by an oven. Now, on the one hand, we can cook some, two things at the same time. Milk and meat, as long as one of them is covered, but at the same time, we try to go 24 hours between uses uh, on the oven itself. We only have one, uh, one compartment to it. So, um, if something were cooked in a meat or dairy oven, then we definitely wouldn't go through this whole structure of waiting uh, six hours or mm -hmm. one hour after after eating it. So we're not even if something were cooked with stock or with a sauce, but you'd actually eat the pieces of meat. There are those who want it to be a little bit uh, more than it. Again, the thought is that first of all it's made out of second of all it says that if you don't have actual meat between your teeth, like what's the big deal? So if someone prepared a chicken soup in theory and then strained the uh, the bones, the skin and the meat uh, content, so you could theoretically say, well, according to my opinion, I'm within my rights to uh, you know, clean my teeth and go ahead and have uh, dairy ice cream for dessert. So we don't do this. It's definitely not recommended, but uh, it would be harder for us to explain to someone who asked why that should not be permitted. First of all, it's chicken. Second of all, it's you know, a strain. It's you know, also made. Great question. So let's be honest. We can ask good questions. I mean, it sounds like it would be halakhic for us. Would I chastise someone for doing such a thing? I mean, So if chicken um, is sometimes considered not meat, when you have a, a meal that's a simcha and you're supposed to eat meat and wine, would chicken fulfill that? Excellent question. Um, Before my, mar my wedding, my marriage, you know, not eating chicken every Friday night, it's like a typical Ashkenazi Shabbat dinner, people have chicken. That's like the Friday night so meal. Who wasn't eating chicken? You were eating chicken. No, no. I'm saying this is this is when you're explaining that you oh, know, chicken did, may did, not be. He did tell me it's yeah. um, But but in according to the thought process that you explained, so, that then the chicken would not really be considered. Right. So what did he say? Comment on this. He he comments on the uh, the popular and widespread. Uh, Ashkenazi custom to eat dairy products on uh, Shavuot. So he just politely mentions that there is no mention of this in any other, and certainly not by the Sephardim, not the traditional literature, uh, and certainly nothing in uh, on the Sephardi bookshelf that would indicate that we should eat anything but red meat on Shavuot like we do any other time. He mentions, especially on the holidays, even more so than Shabbat, we have an obligation to eat red meat. And he says this obligation shouldn't be fulfilled ideally with chicken. In other words, if someone's poor, that's all they can afford, so absolutely, you're doing something huge, and you know, you do what you can to make uh, Shabbat and Chagim as enjoyable as possible. I went to many, many a wedding in Israel where you, know, you were lucky if they were serving chicken, which is fine, it comes for the food, you know, but if you can afford it, great, if you can't afford it, great. Uh, lots of weddings, for example, were uh, in Shilot, where you have two, three, four hundred guys that might show up and will eat you out of house and home. They have what they call marot masamchim, like they have uh, chicken fingers or you know something, uh, chicken wings, just to give the guys uh, who have to dance on an empty stomach. You know, but if that's what you can afford. Great. So at least it's kind of rabbinically considered meat, really for the purposes of not eating milk with it, um, but in the sense that it's more expensive and a little bit more luxurious than tofu. You know, it kind of fulfills the the aspect of spending a little bit more. We eat on Shabbat and Chagim and uh, special occasions like weddings. And, uh, enjoying it, it's fatty, it's tasty, it's you know, all that and then some. But ideally, wherever red meat is called for, we would you know, try to uh, 
seems for me. So, uh, again, not to offend anybody who has a wedding and can only afford chicken, that's fantastic. You know, they can do it great. Well, that does make the point that uh, this is an obligation that's best uh, fulfilled with, uh, with red meat, if possible. Right, the obligation to eat uh, red meat on Shabbat. So he mentions that by the Chagim, you have an obligation, Masamachta Mechagecha, it's an obligation to be, uh, to be happy, to rejoice on the holidays. But the Quran understands the Chag referred to as the Qurban Chagia. Qurban Chagia is the, the, there are a few different sacrifices we bring on the Chagim. One of them is in the Olat Riyah, there's a, a sacrifice, a young lamb typically, it's brought um, upon arriving at Beit HaMikdash on one of these occasions, three times a year. It's a small animal that's, you know, Olat, it's burnt in its entirety on the Mizbech, except for the potentially coagulated milk in its stomach that Shlomo Ash is going to be drinking. Uh, the rest of it is going to be burnt on the, uh, on the Mizbech. There's another Qurban called the Qurban Shlamin, it's Qurban HaChagiyah, it's the specific name of this Qurban. It's the, uh, the meat from which you are supposed to be eating during the holiday. You're in Yerushalayim, it needs to be eaten in Yerushalayim. It's a sacrifice that you bring, the fat and the dam and the lifeblood are going to be uh, burnt on the Mizbeach, uh, the blood is going to be poured there, and you would be eating from this, the portion that doesn't pour too well into one, and be eating uh, over the course of the holiday. So the Gemara says the expression is Bizman Shem Mikdash Kayam and Simchar of Masal At the time when Bet Mikdash was in existence, there is no Simcha, meaning no fulfillment of the mitzvah of being happy without the red meat of your Kurban Chagiga and the wine that you drink along with it. So today we don't have the sacrifice itself. Maybe it's not a biblical obligation to have red meat on the Chagim, but on Shabbat, interestingly enough, and we'll have to discuss this at some point, there is no obligation. Not a biblical one, anyway, to be happy on Shabbat. An obligation to be happy every day, sure. But um, the Chagim are more about joy, about simcha, about rejoicing, about celebrating. Shabbat is more about ta'anuk, it's more about uh, pleasure. You're supposed to enjoy the Shabbat, I work hard all week. Comes Shabbat, I have my food is already prepared, I'm not doing any melacha. I'm not uh, distracting myself from focusing on pure enjoyment. And so here it's more a function of what you enjoy. On the holidays, maybe you'd be a little bit more encouraged to eat red meat. But if you don't like meat or you're allergic to it, I did meet someone. I have one or two people in my life that have such a thing, an allergy to certain proteins and certain meats. Uh, then, if it causes you to suffer, you would avoid it. It's not your enjoyment. People prefer fish or they don't like fish. So, really, Shabbat is all about what you like to eat. That's the, the point of the Shabbat. On the Chagim, on the other hand, yeah, there are sacrifices that are expected to eat from them. What does a vegetarian do on Pesach? <laughs> Is there no vegetarians on Pesach? I don't know. I have to find a way. Mr. Kazai and something. I eat vegetarians. Yeah. Okay, I have yeah. two questions. <laughs> one that is like a little related, and one, I mean, there was Pesach. For example, let's take tonight. I know for a fact the falafel and like all those things were made in a, in a meat restaurant. Okay, but I have cookies and I know are dairy. Can I have them on the same table? So, the, the quick fire answer would be, uh, you know, that sounds like a challenging situation. Uh, then That's why the, I'm not waiting until you get to that point, because right. I don't want to make a mistake so next the, week. So the responsible rabbinic answer would be, let's think uh, these cookies that are dairy. They actually have dairy products in them, they're prepared on dairy equipment, uh, you know, is the dairy palpable? Uh, are the products that are prepared on meat equipment actually made with meat in them? Uh, is it just uh, something that, for example, was fried in oil that may have been used to fry meat too? In which case it might fall in the category of you know, something you wouldn't eat along with milk or, uh, or cheese, but you could eat before or after. It might not be as big a deal as, uh, as you might typically think. A classic example would be something like a hot dog where there's so little meat in it and so many other ingredients that's probably part of it anyway. <laughs> I think the meat's only uh, an excuse. So, um, so yeah, it would depend. If it was cooked, that's another topic I think we'll talk about uh, next week, but uh, how, how distanced you are from the milk and the meat. Again, cooking them together is the problem. And well, like the falafel I know wasn't cooked together, but it was like in the same so order. They may have a deep fryer that's only for falafel and uh, Thing. Maybe they use the same thing for, 
items that have uh, that have meat in them. But even so, you're not eating meat. What you're eating is something that was cooked in oil that may have been potentially flavored by meat. And that's a different category. That's already not something. I mean, the poskim, the halachic authorities were looking to be lenient. They were looking to be strict. So if it wasn't meat itself, or you have these discussions, no, does it really count? If it was stock, does it really count? So that we're actually careful about. Um, chicken was a funny discussion, but it seems that uh, the majority of opinion held that it should be dealt with the same way as meat because the Mishnah says is we don't do it. But if something was cooked in pots or pans that were used at some point to cook meat, and, and then you want to serve uh, dairy, preparing in the same pot might be less recommended, though it may still be halakhically permissible under certain circumstances. But if it's distanced from it, doesn't have any milk or any meat in it, may not be that big a deal. Totally out of left field. But Ravadja permits you to fry an egg in a meat pan because the oil is the intermediary. You're using, say, a neutral oil as opposed to using butter. My grandmother on action to fry her eggs in butter. Um, but if you are frying uh, um, an, an omelet in a meat pan with the new oil, he permits you to put cheese on top of that egg once it's out of the pan. That sounds heretical. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Don't blame me, I gave you the address. But yeah. So imagine that. So it's a pan that was used to cook meat. Even if the pan wasn't, was, wasn't, was used within 24 hours. Because well, if it wasn't used within 24 hours, it's not even a question. If it wasn't used in 24 hours, he permits you to do this ideally. It's not like, oh, you put cheese on it, you can go ahead and eat things. You're going to go ahead and do it. If it wasn't used in 24 hours, and because there's what's called a tintan, but not tintan. Right. So right, you end up in a situation where there is absolutely nothing forbidden to speak of. And even so, there are those who wouldn't do it. But he does make that uh, make that case. So, uh, yes, if you can wait 24 hours, it should be clean before him. Um, but there's uh, there are at least two different angles you can attack it from. Either it's you change uh, the oil, so it's a but on time anyway. It's like two steps removed. Or waiting 24 hours if it's clean, it might in theory be enough to uh, reduce it to something not even need to It's a custom that we don't uh, we don't do so intentionally. So, anyone have any? Milk, meat, or devil related questions? Yeah. This question for a child, what do you do and what age do you start waiting for? Uh, excellent question. So, uh, children are obligated to keep their clothes from the age of 12 and 13. Mm -hmm. It's a Torah's way of admitting that women are more mature than men. Mm -hmm. um, and that's changed a lot in the last uh, 2,000 years, right? <laughs> it's amazing. I talked to guys in their 40s and 50s. I'm ready to settle down. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, so a child has um, no biblical obligations. It's a theory; can do whatever he or she wants. You have the obligation to teach your children. So, no one is as strict with kids as they are with adults. And if you are, that's crazy because there are things they just don't understand. Um, the good advice to Gabriel Chaya is to say that you shouldn't feed your kids milk and meat together. <laughs> it's pretty sound advice. Uh, but that you shouldn't necessarily make them wait between one and the other. Because if your kid sees uh, milk chocolate or dairy ice cream, they're going to freak out. You know, how can this be? Uh, like it's, it's, it's cruel, it's unjust. We're back to Eov. <laughs> it's the devil himself who <laughs> you know, put that milk chocolate right there at the cash register in the supermarket where they always put the good chocolate in. <laughs> so, uh, until what age? Uh, until like 30. <laughs> no, until what oh, age? like chocolate? Yeah. Um, so really, once the kids can kind of get the, uh, an appreciation, understanding of these concepts, you, you can slowly try to, uh, to introduce them. Is there a point of like making them wait three hours and then, because I know people that do that, mm -hmm. like, until they're 11, 12, I know three hours, thing. and then it gets six. And it kind of depends on the kid. I mean, uh, an intelligent child who kind of gets the idea and knows what it's about. Maybe it's you know, a good idea to introduce a little bit earlier. And they have kids that just okay, appreciate choice. lots of different things. And maybe they also just want the bigger things. So yeah, but don't don't push the kids too fast or too hard. I don't think it's a, it's a good idea. So my suggestion would be you know, uh, five or six. Chazal the Gemara identifies kids generally as like the Gif uh, around five or six or seven, depending on the mitzvah. Um, I don't think it's uh, it's worth trying to push. Sometimes people like to believe, oh yeah, my kid's three, but he's a genius. He knows <laughs> everything, <laughs> just like me. <laughs> These precocious parents have precocious kids. So 
if, uh, if the child really gets it and knows and understands, it's fine. Um, but I don't think there's much educational value to it before the age of five or six or seven. And again, we're talking about something that's rabbinic and it's probably got more than one rabbinic layer to it. So there are things that are biblical that your kids can spend time doing that they probably should you know, occupy a higher spot on the list of priorities. So I think probably five, six, or seven is not a bad age to, to start. Yeah, but pepperoni pizza, no. I mean, there's certain things. There's no reason for them to try and enjoy it when they find out. <laughs> Funny story, I remember when uh, I had uh, two students in the process of conversion, and they both, um, they both did their tevila on uh, the same day. One of them basically grew up in America, his family was originally from Europe, and the other one is from, uh, from the Caribbean, Spanish-speaking uh, Caribbean. So uh, the night before, the, uh, they went to the, uh, the Mekoya the following day. Someone, I don't know why, it was a horribly tactless, but uh, someone asked them if they're going out to, uh, to have a massive uh, pork festival. You know, like, why don't you guys go out and just eat uh, chicharron, you know, <laughs> have baking and enjoy this, that, the other thing. And the guys said the two of them looked at each other and they said, "Why on earth would we torture ourselves? <laughs> Why enjoy something that you used to eat when you took upon yourself this, you know, mission to uh, to sanctify yourself in every possible way?" And that's one of them. So uh, I don't see the sense in, in intentionally getting them used to eating, to eating certain things. I mean, uh, and, and wherever possible, you can time it that way. So, for example, your kids have dairy for breakfast and meat for uh, for lunch. Abraham Avinu did too. It's not that big a deal if they're having them the meat afterwards. How long you make them wait from having meat to having their favorite dairy dessert at night? Kids typically don't have much of a For example, do you use the same like dishes for milk and meat for child? If it's like the dish for the child. They were his dishes, maybe. Yeah, <laughs> like you have the... The easy solution You clean them apart. Right, is to use glass. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, it's for them all that way that there's no... That doesn't react to anything. Mm, okay, but anything. for a child, could you like... Uh, <laughs> kind of like a plastic, you're not going to give a child that's two years old. <laughs> yeah. It's going to break it every three minutes. Right. Right. So like the cute little plastic plates. Yeah, yeah. 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 Can you put like the meat in it? Yeah. Yeah. You'll all have kids yeah. very soon and you'll realize that there is no use for glass anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> I'd install plastic windows if I could. So we went out uh, the other night, we're celebrating uh, uh birthday. She just turned, uh, I want to say eight. Eight. Eight, thank you. <laughs> It wasn't, wasn't so clear on that one. And, uh, <laughs> and we, we came to the restaurant, so I, I walk into a restaurant, my wife was teaching, so it was just me and seven kids, and so we had a lot of funny looks on the way in, and as soon as we got in, the kids saw glass, and they loved it. <laughs> they're sitting there tapping on it with their spoons, and their forks, and their knives, and so one of the waiters is like, uh, sir, you want plastic for the kids, right? <laughs> and I'm not cleaning that up, you know? <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah, so... You know, it's nice if you can teach the kids there's a difference between these things. Generally, the, the rule is what they can understand and appreciate you do. Same thing, by the way, Tisha B'Av and Yom Kippur. The kids say, oh, Abanima, are eating? That's great. I want to be just like Abanima for about 15 minutes. <laughs> and then I want to eat. So, okay, if the child understands Beit HaMikdash, understands you know, the destruction, understands uh, slavery, poverty, exile, uh, <laughs> you know, idolatry, uh, etc. <laughs> maybe those are concepts you can, uh, you can start to, uh, to discuss. But I guess was destroyed because people spoke with Shankara, etc. We don't eat because we're sad, and it's a way of showing that you're sad, etc. You can do with that. A three-year-old child understands practically nothing. Uh, why am I not? This is true even of punishment stuff. So talk about that some other time. Mm -hmm. Punishing a child is three. I mean, their memory is about five seconds long. So if your child broke something, now because you broke this, you go to your go to my room. What did I do? And they mean it. What do you mean? That was like three years ago. What do you think about a cup that I broke? It? No, they don't, it doesn't register. So you're going to punish them for something they don't even remember or understand. And you're just a crazy parent, and probably everybody your age is crazy. And hang out with kids and learn from them. And they're not that wrong. You get older, you understand those relationships, what you did and what you said, and how things, uh, you know, the, the rights and entitlements that you have afterwards. And there are entire governments that don't understand this and expect your kids to. So. The, the general rule is five, five, six, or seven is a good, good way to start. And even then, start with biblical concepts and then once we we'll look up to. Very good. We've got some people to continue production here next week.